I drove around Japan for two weeks straight, going into every second hand shop we could find, looking at some of the rarest retro games and consoles ever made. Over the next couple of months, I'll be taking you guys along the journey with me as we explore this beautiful country and see what insane stuff we can buy. These videos were made entirely possible by Sendico. They're a service which allows you to buy all of the things you love from Japan and ship it all in one box to your door anywhere in the world. But more on them later. This is episode one. The flight to Japan took me nearly 14 hours. I had hardly slept at all, so I was running on fumes. Japan is eight hours ahead, so the first days were tough. But not long after stepping off the plane, we found the first hard off. Hard off is a chain of secondhand stores, which are all over the country. It's anyone's guess as to what you'll find in these shops, but they seem to sell literally anything. Gaming is huge everywhere in the world, but in Japan, it seems to be bigger. So the game sections in these shops were just overflowing with amazing stuff. Nearly all of which comes from Japan in the first place, so you can find some very special items which we might not have gotten in the rest of the world. This Panasonic Q, for example, was only released in Japan, and it's insanely hard to find with the Game Boy attachment. That's a lot more expensive, but that's a Hello Kitty one. It's quite yeah, a rare yeah. one. The Game Boy Light's expensive, but you can only get them in Japan. There are stacks and stacks of games, all of which are gonna be in Japanese, but this also means that they have different labels featuring much cooler artwork. Every hard off has a junk section, which is literally buckets and buckets of this so-called junk. But one man's rubbish is another man's Game Boy YouTube repair videos. Is it a cradle? for a hundred yen. Yeah. There's two of them. Oh, that was for um, the karaoke, the Nintendo uh, 64 karaoke. One thing I thought would be sick was to wear a GoPro and rummage through the buckets of junk and see what cool stuff we could find. So expect lots of that over the next few weeks. I'll be showing you the absolute huge haul of stuff I bought from this trip at the end of the series, and we can go through it all. And I'll be giving away so much of it, so make sure you stick around. We were just about to head back to the hotel and we've just driven past a little game shop. So we're gonna go and check it out. We are still in Tokyo, but it seems like we're in the middle of nowhere. And then there's just a random TV game shop. No way. Now this random little shop was awesome. It was very reasonably priced for Tokyo and I actually ended up buying a few bits from here. 9,000 yen, $67 or 54 pounds for a minty boxed Game Boy Color is a very reasonable price. In most cases, that's what a slightly gross unit only would cost you in the UK on eBay. And remember, this is being sold in a store in the middle of a city. I saw this awesome Starlight Gold GameCube, which is a Japanese exclusive. And this one was boxed and for hardly any money and a Hyper Boy, which I've reviewed before on the channel. Speaking of which, here's a few awesome accessories I've made videos on. At this point, I was completely disheveled, hanging on by a thin thread, but fueled by the bargains I pushed on.
I bought this. It's a, a waterproof Game Boy case. I've actually made a video on one of these, but I got rid of it. So, and then yeah, this is a, a DS game that you plug the game into, and then you can uh, you interact in basically in the real world with this, which uses the same technology as a mouse. And then we also picked up an actual DS Lite. 1100 yen works perfectly and it's in great condition so this whole thing came to about 18 pounds i recommend it 18 pounds i'm much more with it today so we're going to get a lot more actually filmed on the vlog hopefully some more hard offs hopefully some more amazing food let's go Day two was filled with even cooler stuff. It was time to head into the heart of it all in Tokyo, Akihabara. This is the place. Here is where we're gonna find some of the coolest retro tech on this planet. It's likely to be insanely expensive, but still really cool to see. We're gonna start in the famous Super Potato. There's a few of these around the country and this one is perhaps the most iconic. Immediately on the right as you walk in, there's a junk box filled with goodies like this old Famicom in need of a bit of a restoration. There was a bunch of display cabinets scattered around which featured the absolute creme de la creme. Unfortunately, most of it isn't for sale, which was painful, but you know, I have most of it already. <laughs> Speaking of something I have, here's an Imagineer glow-in-the-dark Game Boy Pocket, which was an astonishing thousand pounds. I'm sorry, Super Potato, but for that price, it's a Super Potato. They also had a Famitsu Game Boy Pocket and an ultra-rare Pokemon Game Boy Micro for £2,600. Bloody mashed potato. <laughs> Here's a bunch more things, not for sale. A Famitsu Game Boy Lite and a signed Famitsu Game Boy Pocket. There's a few insanely rare console variations like this Dreamcast that I had never seen before. And honestly, this blew my mind. The Super D Damon, 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 I've got no idea edition. There's less than 50 of these in the world. There was also a few very rare box promotional Game Boys like this ANA Airlines Game Boy Pocket and a really cool Lions Game Boy Pocket with the bag it even came with. Then we saw the first ever Pokemon edition Game Boy Color with the lowest serial number possible. This was certainly a super potato, whatever that means. And to finish it off, a Hudson Game Boy Pocket. Good golly. I found nothing about this online, so I can only assume it might be a one-off. Heading around with the GoPro just to take a look at a couple more bits. Here's a lovely Famicom disc system and a Mega CD2, as well as a Mega CD. And here's a look at the sheer amount of games. You could easily spend an entire day in here looking through all of these. But there's more to see elsewhere, so let's pop upstairs quickly and then let's head out. The streets in this place were flooded with buckets of junk. Before we even made it to the hard off, there was a shop next to it with a Famicom Sharp console, super rare and exclusive to Japan. They also had a wall of faulty PSPs for under $20 each. It was amazing to see that people of all age ranges were rummaging through this junk. Even this dude looking at a couple of old games. Here's a really cool box Super Scope for the Super Famicom. There wasn't anything of much interest in the junk boxes, but I promise some of the stores we'll go into later in this series will blow your mind. So we just went into the hard off, and to be honest with you, there isn't a lot there. And that does make sense given that this is in the middle of the most popular area to come. But it was still obviously nice to see all these random bits just hanging up for sale because you don't really get to see stuff like that in the UK. We're in such an amazing part of Akihabara right now. There's literally just like stands on the side of the roads with stuff for sale. Uh, it's, it's incredible. It's sensory overload, but it's absolutely incredible. Before we explore the Tokyo nightlife, let's head into one final hard off. I 
a few really cool games including this Castlevania, but actually quite slim pickings. You can see this Game Boy Advance is so overpriced. Honestly, the difference in price in Tokyo versus some of the other places we went to in the country is huge. Oh. Boom. <laughs> that is bright. <laughs> it's kind of sick though. Please, please don't turn that on. <laughs> Night time in Tokyo. It's time to go and find some food and find a place to go and get a drink. I thought I'd bring you along with us because we're in a really, really cool area in Tokyo. Uh, and the, the, the place where we're going to get some food is really beautiful. So let's go and check it out. We headed into this Wagyu restaurant and I genuinely ate some of the most delicious food of my life. So I might be a little bit drunk. I also might be experiencing quite a lot of jet lag. I need to show you this area that we're in and I don't know where we are, so I'll put it on the screen. This is how you get there, right? And you could walk past it and continue in that direction. Or, you go down here, come with me. You've got the vending machines, you've got the cute little bars, you've got other streets, you've got amazing signs absolutely everywhere. If you come further down, alleyways, random <laughs> alleyways, staircases, go up those stairs. And then, let's go down here. I've teleported into another row of tiny staircases, of alleyways, of signs everywhere. I am truly in one of the most amazing places I've ever been to in my life. This place at night time was just breathtaking. The lights, the streets, the little alleyways, the atmosphere, pure culture. A contrast like I had never witnessed before. Everything I had read about Japan in old books by Yukio Mishima and Murakami, I was in it. I was there. We had such an amazing night, and I was feeling so euphoric and grateful for this opportunity. If it wasn't for Sendako, none of this would have been possible. I've been working with them for years now, and they've been so great to me. They're responsible for all of the amazing things I've bought over the years on this channel, so I urge you to go and check them out. They have very low fees and excellent customer service. Before you know it, you'll have an amazing collection of Japanese stuff on your shelf, and you didn't have to spend a small fortune and 15 hours on a plane going to Japan to buy it. Check them out in the link in the description, and I'll see you in the next episode.